everyone, and welcome to the first Ask Android live session on modern Android development. My name is Rebecca Franks, and I'll be your host for this session. We will be answering your questions on architecture components, Kotlin, Android Studio, and performance. There is also a separate Jetpack Compose and Material U Ask Android session tomorrow. We will be able to ask deeper questions related to those specific topics. So feel free to pop your questions into the chat, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. But before we get into that, a quick round of intros from everyone that we have in the panel today. Hi, uh, I'm Yit. I work in the Android Jetpack team. Hi, everyone. I'm Manuel Vigo, and I'm part of the Android Developer Relations team. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda. I'm a product manager on Android. Hello, I'm Wojtek. I'm an engineer on the Developer Relations team. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. All right, so just a quick reminder, pop the questions into the live chat, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So we do have a couple that already came in from Twitter before the show, so we can dive straight into asking some of them. And the first one, um, if somebody is very interested in Android development and has no idea about Jetpack uh, Compose or Jetpack in general, what is your advice for them? Great, I can, I can take that question. That's a great question. I think there are a lot of people in that situation and this is something that the team has thought about um, and has uh, provided and created resources for getting started. So the purpose of Jetpack is to help developers build Android apps with modern design practices. So it's a suite of libraries uh, to help you accelerate your development, uh, follow best practices, re reduce boilerplate, and then also write code that works consistently across different Android versions and also Android devices. Um, so the components work, uh, they can be adopted individually or they can work together. Um, if you go to um, android.developer.com slash jetpack, uh, there's a lot of information there. Uh, there's also a getting started um, walkthrough, a page that walks you through the various different um, articles, uh, code labs, online training that really walks you through um, overall how to approach uh, either um, adopting Jetpack into your existing app or creating a new app uh, with Jetpack. Um, there's lots of examples. Um, and so there's a lot of great resources there. Um, and if there's any feedback uh, that anyone has on additional things that can help uh, people ramp up and, and that really dive into the material, uh, we're definitely uh, uh, happy to, to get that feedback. And also, if anyone's a complete beginner, we also have training courses that are made specifically to walk you through like getting started with programming. And they also teach the best practices with Jetpack. So if you search for Android basics in Kotlin, for example, uh, you can get started. And from there, you can go and explore the different Jetpack libraries as well. Awesome. OK, next question. What is the best way to collect flows in from the Android UI? I think uh, I can take this question. The, the best way and the safest one is to use the, the repeat on lifecycle suspend function. And actually, you would collect from the flow inside the body uh, of the function. Alternatively, you can use the flow with lifecycle flow operator. And that's going to be practically the same thing. The good thing about these API is that they are lifecycle aware. And so they are only going to collect from the flow whenever the UI is visible on the screen which is something that the alternatives then do. So yeah, use those APIs. Awesome. OK, I have some performance problems in my app. Where do I go to start debugging with these kind of issues? And what tools should I use? Uh, so we have a few different Jetpack libraries uh, that target uh, optimizing performance. So uh, there's a macro benchmark library that helps you measure startup um, and scrolling or jank uh, frame performance within your app. Um, and then we also have a benchmark library that measures uh, CPU cost of specific functions. Um, so these libraries, um, they can be used remotely um, to track uh, metrics in a continuous integration uh, form, or um, you can also do them locally and profiling results are viewable within uh, Android Studio. So in terms of uh, tooling, there's also um, within Studio, there are um, various different profiler tools that you can use to measure um, different metrics that you're looking at for performance. Um, and then we know that performance is, is a very difficult thing to, uh, even if you get the metrics and you, you know, you're seeing the data to figure out how can you troubleshoot it, how can you really optimize it? There's um, some guidance that we have provided as well um, online to help you walk through some specific examples um, just to kind of um, give additional guidance and uh, uh, additional uh, hints as to where you can start diving deeper into the data that's output from your um, benchmark data. 
Yeah, additionally, there was a perform performance math skills series that happened something like a month ago. So I highly recommend everyone to check out the YouTube uh, channel where we have like four or five videos about performance there. Also a Q&A session with the team. That was very helpful. Great. So when is the next Android Studio coming out? So I, I guess I can take this one. Uh, so we don't normally give dates uh, because any any date that we give, you know, releases slip, and then it wouldn't be fair to give everyone this expectation that it releases on a certain date. But you know, if you follow Android Studios tracks like Canary and Beta, and then release candidates, you can more or less figure out uh, when the next stable release will be, um, and it's basically when we are confident um, through release candidates that you know any major bugs are found and fixed uh, we don't want to we don't want people to encounter any major problems uh, at launch so the one thing I can uh, ask everyone to do is test out the beta versions uh, the pre-release versions and do let us know if you find anything um, that's not working Great. So for new apps or features, should I learn motion layout over Compose? Difficult question. OK, I'll give it a try. <laughs> I, so we, learning motion layout over Compose is not like not super accurate because they are they different view systems. Uh, Ideally, you should go with Compose, especially for a new app. There's not much reason to try to write an application with the old view system unless you have some like historical code base. Uh, we have constraint layout working in uh, Compose already. I don't know the plans for motion layout. I assume it will probably come, but like the Compose animation APIs are so beautiful that you can actually do a lot of those stuff yourself with Compose a lot easier than you were able to do with the views. And in the worst worst case scenario, if you really want to use motion layout, you could embed regular views inside your Compose applications. They're fully interoperable. Uh, so you can always do that by my recommendation is go towards Compose because that's the feature. Great. That was a little bit of a burning question, I think. <laughs> All right. So now there's apparently one that's super popular. Um, everyone wants to know the answer to this one. What is preferred, MVVM or MVI? Manuel? Okay. Yeah, I think I can take this one. In fact, I, there isn't that much difference between the, the two approaches. Like for people that don't know, MVVM refers to model view model, MVI and model view intent. And both of them are you know, a way to do unidirectional data flow, which is actually the preferred way to architect your, your applications. So, I mean, the one you choose depends on the needs of your application, depends on if you want to model user intents with MVI, then having pretty much everything reactive or not. It depends on, on your app, but uh, I mean, no matter which one you use, you are set up for success. I think those are good patterns because they, they follow UDF, as I was mentioning before. Great. OK, best way to communicate from update of data from the repo to a view model? Flows. Uh, flows or suspend functions. It depends whether it's a, a one-shot call, then it's a suspend function. If you need to stream of data, use flows. That's a recommendation. Yeah, so like something to add there. Like no, normally when you try to design these problems, thinking about how can a repository notify a view model, it will kind of get you into trouble because the view model has a smaller life cycle than a repository regularly. The way to think about this is mostly if view model is interested in some information from the repository, it will observe something or like collect something, whether you're using RxJava or, or coroutines. Uh, but like that, that small difference, of like a, the thinking perspective, whether you're trying to notice, like change something in your view model and something happens in repository versus thinking about your view model observing some data in your repository because it is interested in the information will actually help you avoid a lot of problems down the line. So always think about whatever has a smaller life cycle that observes the one that has a 
larger life cycle. Uh, that kind of thinking goes very well with UDF as well. Uh, so try to look at the problems from that perspective, and that will be a lot more straightforward for every single case you will face, whether it is between the repository and the view model or the view model and the views. What about lab data? Live data is fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the thing about live data is like it's a very purposeful class that we build for your UI to hold the state for your UI. When you try to use a live data from your repository, it just doesn't scale. And like we don't want to scale it because there's already better reactive libraries. The whole purpose of live data was like just to be very simple to solve a specific case. Uh, so just only use it for that if you need to. Especially if you're using like Kotlin coroutines and flow, you almost have no reason to use live data, but you can if it is easier. Uh, but yeah, like trying to use live data in your repositories or in your rest of your application is just not going to scale well. Yeah, so seeing the live data outside of the UI layer, it's a smell. So reconsider your architecture and all that. And historically, like people used live data because it was integrated with data binding and all that. But for example, right now, state flow is supported by data binding. And now we have these new lifecycle aware coroutines APIs. So yeah, like live data, it's pretty good for what it does, but let's try to move it uh, away from its responsibilities because it's not gonna work. Okay, cool. Um, all right, next, next question. How to start with multi-module apps using Hilt? I think the best way to start, it's uh, taking a look at the docs. Uh, the documentation is going to give you pretty much everything that you need. And regarding multi-modules, it pretty much works as if you had like everything in the app module, because you know, like different modules could expose bindings to different components in the same way. If you are talking specifically about dynamic feature modules, we have a separate page in the documentation that talks about it. So I would highly recommend to, to check those out. Great. OK, um, so let's talk a little bit about Work Manager then. Uh, so the question that's come in is, does Work Manager replace background service? Uh, I don't know what, what's a background service. I, I think if this is the, like the old services in Android, yeah, like there's absolutely no reason to do that. But like Work Manager is designed for uh, stuff that should run like it's important to run it and you can also defer it. Those are the, the two two key points of work manager. So if it doesn't have to run, like it's not any different than your background executor or anything you dispatch uh, through your core teams. Uh, the key difference there is that it's something you want to run, like sending an email, sending a TV that uh, that's when you use work manager. Now you can, in the very, very old days of Android, there was a good reason to create these services so the operating system knew you were doing something. They're probably still relevant. Honestly, I don't know if the operating system still considers them in deciding whether it wants to keep your application uh, running or not. Uh, but there's not really much reason to use them anymore. Uh, so either use your regular executors if you don't care about losing the work, or if it is important, use Work Manager. Yeah, work manager is supposed to be doing persistent work, work that you need to persist. And probably the question was more related to the recent changes, or well not changes, additions to work manager, which was about being able to run foregrounds, foreground services as well. So definitely you can use work manager for that. And now there are new restrictions happening with Android 12. And there are new APIs in work manager, the new version 2.7 that actually it's with this set expedited API that is going to help you out with these new changes in, in Android 12. So check out the docs. Uh, okay, so if, the, so if the question is more about the foreground services, yes, and like overall, uh, we, we wanted to have foreground services early on because like if developer really, really wanted to run in the background, they need to have a reason that they need to show to the user. Uh, later, we realized it kind of gets abused by the applications and then it creates a lot of noise in the notification shade. Uh, so now there's a new expedited job API and the work manager 
handles the backlist compatibility for you, whether you're running on an older version or not. Uh, so just take a look at the release notes for Work Manager 2.7, and that will include what you need to adapt in your application to support the uh, Android 12. Great, lots to learn there. So are there any scenarios that need to be handled with live data rather than using flows? Oh, if not necessarily, like if the, the, the biggest difference between live data and all of flows is that live data has pre-imposed limitations on how it works. That makes this API simple. It is very opinionated on how to handle your life cycle and whatnot. So they're all advantages of live data, but they're also the reason why it does not scale to things like background because it's very, very opinionated. Uh, so I think Jose from Android Derval has a very, very good blog post on uh, trying to convert a live data into a state flow and I explain the differences. So I will say, go read that article and if your use case, if you still believe live data is better for your use case, you can totally use it. Like it's not banned or uh, no, it's not deprecated. But oftentimes like, you can get the same thing with state flow and then it's one less technology to use in your application, which makes it easier to maintain going forward. And also with the new APIs that Manuel mentioned today with the lifecycle aware coroutines APIs that we have, I think they pretty much replicate what live data can do, right? So maybe before these API existed, live data was actually the simpler choice. Uh, now, as as he said, you can get rid of live data if you want to and just, just rely on flows and the APIs that we give you. And correct me if I'm wrong, Manuel, I think you have a talk about this where you explain some of that, right? Yeah, so the talk is uh, Kotlin flows in practice. So if you want to learn about flows in Android, go check it out. Great. Okay. So hopefully those are the last live data questions. Um, how can we reduce build times in Android Studio? Right. So that is a big topic. And we know it's on both developers' minds as well as here the engineers at Google are working on this. Uh, the, the problem is that the build is not just one thing. It's everything from you know Gradle and our plugins from for Gradle as well as the compilers, uh, the other components that build and package resources and so on. And we are tackling the problem uh, one by one. I think the best thing you can do as developers is try to stay on the newest version. So um, whenever we have new versions of Android Gradle plugin, of uh, Kotlin, of you know the various things that you use in your build, also any external plugins that you have, try to update them. Uh, because oftentimes with new releases, we either fix bugs, like bugs that uh, maybe invalidate your caches when they shouldn't. Uh, we make the build more incremental. We uh, work on the speed, speed itself. And uh, there's also new tools coming out, like uh, KSP, which I hope he might uh, talk about in a second, that will make your builds fa build faster in certain scenarios. Um, so yeah, that's my best advice. And also, try not to do too much custom stuff in your build if you don't have to, like making plugins that work well for um, for Gradle and for Android Gradle plugin is not easy. Uh, so if you can, try to stick to just the declarative DSL style configuration. And uh, if you need to do anything more, um, you really need to learn how to do it properly. Interesting. I think there's a lot to learn and a lot to improve. There's so much to cover for making your build smoother and there's so many different things you can do. Okay, so is there a smooth way to transition from legacy pre-Jetpack apps into modern awesome Jetpack apps? I was oh. hoping maybe Manuel will take it. <laughs> I mean, there isn't a checklist that you can say, okay, my app, it's uh, fully Jetpack now. I think it's more of a case of, for me, in my opinion, obviously it's it's all about your architecture. If your architecture is able to scale, and um, for example, you depend on interfaces where you can replace, for example, you know, the, the dependency or your, in your database and things like that, that's really gonna set up your app for success and it's gonna make it able to scale. 
So the idea is get, try to choose a, a good architecture, have it in place, make the, the dependencies that you depend on replaceable in the sense that now if I need to replace, I don't know, uh, short preferences with data store, that's an easy move. So that, that would be my best tip. It do you want something to add? Yeah, I think, I, I guess we, we haven't been hearing this question much because it's been like a couple of years since we had jet, started Jetpack. Uh, but like one of the key things, like maybe if you just even talk, thinking about the specific Jetpack library is when you write a component in your application, try not to reinvent the wheel. So if there is a, like a well accepted open source library or a, there's a Jetpack library, prefer to learn and use that instead of like creating your own, because even though you might feel more comfortable with the implementation, you know, but we spend a lot of time and effort making sure this library works in the older versions, like handles interesting cases. Like the, the foreground changes is a very nice uh, example of that happened where like the, it completely changed in the platform. But if you are using work manager, there's just like minor adjustments you need to wake, make to support it. Versus if you are not using work manager, you will need to change a lot of code to support that. And then like that happens every single version. So I'll say try to use either the Jetpack libraries or the like well-known open source libraries that are already supported by the developers uh, to reduce your liability in your code base. And please test your code. That's really important because if you want to make any change, you don't want to break anything. And testing is the the, the insurance that you have to to do that. Yeah, it's like actually this is a very good example use case. Like in in Jetpack, uh, you know, it's all of this is in open source where we develop, but we also have a downstream branch that uses the tip of three Android. So whatever is in the Android source code master and runs all of our tests with that as well. This make sure if something is going to break in the next version of Android, we actually get notified about it months, months before, and we have to fix it then. Uh, so that will give you a lot of confidence that once the new version of Android comes, you need to update your Jetpack libraries, but then you can be much more comfortable to set your like target SDK version immediately to the new one after doing that update. Awesome. Okay, so next question. Does view models and hilt or dagger have a place in the Compose world? Yeah, they do. Um, we actually recommend that as a, a for example, a view model. Actually, uh, this is going to be a shameless plug, but uh, there is a, a talk in ABS about, uh, it's called a composed state of mind, where they actually talk about the different ways to handle state complexity in Compose. I mean, there you're gonna find things like a composable, something that we call now state holders and the view model. The view model is supposed to be that stakeholder that is gonna be in charge of providing access to the business logic of the app and providing the UI state for a particular screen. And so you can see you are gonna find view models kind of in the root level of your screen, or it could be a route if you are using uh, the Compose navigation. So yeah, they, they have a place in Compose and um, please check out the talk. Okay, cool. So moving on to um, something that was mentioned a bit earlier, is there any bets on building multi-platform apps? And the next question is also kind of related. Can we use Room, Hilt, et cetera, in KMM? Uh, not yet. <laughs> so the, the Kotlin multi-platform is something we are looking into. You might see this in ASP. Uh, that like, we understand developers are interested in the technology and developers also use Jetpack and we don't want Jetpack to be a blocker from you moving to KMM. So you don't need to decide between do I do KMP versus Jetpack. Uh, now, I want to highlight that when we do this, like first we need to validate it, of course. But aside from that, if we, let's say, make a library like Groove multi-platform, we need to make sure it has no impact on the Android on the user. So it needs to be a smooth transition, everything from documentation to, you know, like uh, API compatibility, they still work as expected for existing users. So it is not that straightforward for us to move a library to the multi-platform, uh, but we are looking into technology, like trying to validate it, uh, play with some of the smaller Jetpack libraries to see how it works. So you might be able to see more on this in the future. 
but right now, no, you cannot, but we are looking into it. Um, so if you're interested, just like look at the ASPCLs through GitHub, uh, see what we are doing. Maybe you can even be able to contribute. Uh, it's a long road ahead, but we think this technology might actually work very well. Uh, so we are excited about Kotlin multi-platform as well. Uh, okay, great. So what is the best practice to handle network exceptions or other exceptions using coroutines? The best way is just to use the mechanism that coroutines provide you to handle exceptions. I guess probably that's the answer. We have a bunch of articles about error handling. We also have some talks we've done in the past, uh, but you don't you need to do anything. Just rely on the mechanism that it's built in in coroutines. So it's going to propagate exceptions automatically. For example, you need to understand a little bit how supervisor jobs or supervisor scopes versus coroutine scopes works and all that. There is a, a big amount of things that you have to learn, but then everything makes sense after all. Okay, cool. So how do I automate the process of publishing an app onto the Google Play Store? Uh, I can take this one. So we don't, I believe we don't have anything uh, that's ready made like in Android Studio or in Android Gradle plugin uh, for this. Uh, we know that it's something that the community might want, uh, but actually there is a, a really nice third party plugin that you can use with together with Android Gradle plugin to automate this. Um, so, you know, we might explore providing something like this out of the box in the future, but um, until that happens, if we make that decision or not, um, you can use the open source library for that. Okay, cool. Is there a way to unit test the pager class using remote mediator? If so, where can I find examples? This one's quite specific. Uh, I think so. Right now, I don't think you can, besides having a real collector that will require a UI. Uh, we do have plans to create a like test helper for paging to address these cases because it relies on some internal APIs that we don't want to expose yet. Uh, so right now, the ideal thing is just unit test your remote mediator or integration test your actual paging. Like one of the things about paging is is very very. UI dependent, like it tries to optimize for what you are showing in the UI. Uh, so without having that piece of the code, it becomes a little bit harder to control it. Uh, we know we should add the testing library, so we are going to work on that. But aside from that, I would say either unit test your remote mediator or do an integration test with the UI. Great. Okay. And then what does the macro benching, macro benchmarking library do? So for macro benchmark, um, this library helps you um, uh, set tests for both uh, startup times for your app. If you want to test um, different stages of startup, cold start, warm start. Um, and then also helps you test jank uh, or the different frame performances of your app. Um, so if you're uh, you have an app where there's a lots of lots of scrolling um, that's being done. You want to make sure that there are no drop frames. Um, so it lets you help up specific tests for scenarios that are um, more in line with how users are actually using your app. Um, so there are bigger use cases or scenarios that you can set and target within your app um, in, in terms of uh, measuring those two things. So those are the main things that we're doing right now. And then we're also looking at what are the other key performance metrics um, do we want to track and, and help uh, help you track uh, within your app and add that to the macro benchmark library. But right now we're focusing on uh, startup and jank because those are two different performance metrics that really impact uh, the usability of your app um, and, and uh, impacts business metrics, things like that. And so that's what the feedback that we've gotten that developers really care about. And so that's where we started, but we're planning to continue to expand macro benchmark as well. Great, that sounds super useful. Does data store support encryption? Uh, not out of the box. So we, we are actually think about creating that integration as well. But right now, with, when you use data store, you can 
provide how you serialize it to disk. So you can have your own encryption behind data store. It's just there's no module that does it out of the box for you. Uh, but it's, it's super simple if you have an encryption library to uh, inject it to data store. We are also looking forward to providing something very similar to how we do with encrypted shared preferences. Uh, but it will take a while because we want to take it out of shared preferences, make the library by itself, and then use the APIs provided by data store uh, to support encryption out of the box. Awesome. Thank you so much. So thanks. Unfortunately, we run out of time. So thanks so much for all your questions. If you have any more, do feel free to reach out to the panelists on Twitter if you have any further questions. And be sure to join the on the live stream. Thanks for watching and goodbye.